I don't know a whole lot about reverse engineering firmware, but I'd like to learn more. I don't know about the tech, I don't know about the engineering, I don't know all about the hardware hacking stuff that goes into a whole lot of the smart devices that are in our world and how you can approach them for security. But in this video, I'd like to play with something small, something easy to kind of get our feet wet, and then I'd like to hear from you. Hey, what are the other tips and tricks? What are the tools? What things should I know and learn more about? And what should everyone learn more about to get into this whole internet of things? First things first, credit where credit is due. What I'm gonna be showcasing is a whole lot of material that Kavishka Gihan has already written about way back in 2021. It is a simple, small, hey, quick and easy way to try out some of the reverse engineering for firmware where you can dig into the internal file system. In some cases, you might find firmware for a device where you've got a whole operating system that you can drill down into and explore tons of different things that might be vulnerable. I'll leave the link to this article in the description, but I think I wanna drive the point home that a whole lot of these internet of things and smart devices are using a lot of technology that is old and like maybe deprecated and legacy. And there are going to be a good amount of vulnerabilities if you actually drill down, dig in them and find them. But hey, if you don't believe me, let me show you. I realize what we're gonna be showcasing in this video as the example is already pretty old stuff, like 2014, maybe 2013, about a decade old, but I think a lot of these devices are still running something just like this, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anyway, I'm on Softpedia to go ahead and download this driver, and it's kind of sketch, right? Such is Softpedia. Uh, let me see if I can download this here. Okay, cool, looks like that has pulled down into my downloads folder. Now I'm gonna fire up a terminal and I'm going to make a directory for firmware. I'll move into that directory, and then I wanna move from my downloads folder that firmware into this current directory. It is a zip file, of course, so we'll go ahead and extract that with unzip. I can use tab completion to pull this all together here, and now I have this wr1042nv blah 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 dot bin file. I'm gonna rename this to just simply firmware.bin, I think I'm cool with that if you're good with it. Uh, and of course, if we actually take a look at the file output of this, it is going to tell me that this is firmware, right? For the TP-Link router that we're gonna be exploring in this video. And what we might be able to do, and I've done this in a couple of Capture the Flag challenges, and you might have just as well for different forensics category stuff, but if we actually use some of our like usual forensics tools, like a foremost or a bin walk, we might be able to just go ahead and extract, I'll use bin walk tack E, on our firmware.bin and see what it can track down. I'm probably super duper zoomed in on the terminal here, so yeah, this is gonna look like nonsense, uh, but let me see what we have. All right, so at the base of the file, we have TP-Link firmware header, which makes sense. We have the LZMA compressed data, TP-Link firmware header once more, and a, another reference to LZMA compressed data. I do get a whole lot of these warnings and errors. Extractor failed to run external extractor Sasquatch. Oh, for the squash file system. Uh, and that might be worthwhile trying to find out what it's doing. If I LS, do I have anything in this extracted firmware directory? I do. I have what looks like, uh, I suppose, a squash file system. System, and maybe it even tried to pull it out here in the squash FS root. Can I move into that directory? Ooh, yeah, so it's a full-blown Linux file system here, right? These are all the files that would be present inside of the firmware for the device. At this point, basically, Binwalk has done all the hard work for me. I've just passed it tack E and it extracted all the stuff and I'm just gonna press the I believe button that, hey, you know what, I've got a file system to work with. To be honest, this is really the gist of the Medium article and we sort of skipped a step because Binwalk did it all for us. But because we have the file system here, now we could drill down into things like a lot of default settings, like maybe default credentials that could be used like Telnet to gain access to the thing, configure it remotely, something stupid like that, right? Or we might even be able to honestly move into the etc. directory and try to check out specific passwords, right? We have etc. password, we have etc. shadow, we could honestly check out what is in the etc. shadow file. Here are our root or admin credentials stored in their encrypted representation, but could we kick this to John the Ripper or Hashcat and just try to figure out what the default credentials might be? Just for funsies, let me try to go ahead and do that. Let me, uh, I'll just nano what this hash will be and I'll slap it in there. Now I can use John the Ripper on that hash and I suppose we can set the word list to like, I don't know, rock you, is that fair? User share word lists, rock you dot text. And I guess let's just let this thing go. <laughs> 
It might be something stupid like admin, admin, admin pairing or admin password or it might, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, could be anything. Of course, you could Google this if it is something that's natural here. Let me get back to the firmware. But if we take a look at the root file system again, let me ls tack la here so we can see where some of these sim links are referring to. We do have BusyBox as like the all in one binary to do a whole lot of the Linux command line stuff. And that's set up as Linux RC. So probably just the first thing that kicks off to control and run the operating system as this firmware is loaded. The thing is, look at all these binaries and how their date is like 2013. We could move into the bin directory, see what else we have for actual binaries, and then try to see if there are any other vulnerabilities or potential things that we could exploit as part of these. This, however, is where I get to the edge of my understanding, and I don't know a whole lot where else to go, unless I like manually, one at a time, crack open each binary in Ida or Ghidra or whatever disassembler debugger we want. I would really love an easy button, and I think that is why I wanted to showcase this to lead us up to, honestly, look, today's sponsor of this video is just so stinking cool. They're new to the family, and I really hope you'll help me welcome them with warm, hey, wide open arms here. Please allow me to share some support for today's sponsor, Bugproof. Do you have a smartwatch or a home security system or even just use a doorbell with a camera and internet connection? Every day, devices get smarter and smarter and the internet of things is already an integral part of our lives. But how do you test these devices for security? Bugproof makes internet of things security research easier. Whether or not you're an engineer or a security researcher, it's no secret that IoT or operational technology is difficult. You need to know low-level languages like C and assembly and understand hardware and electrical engineering concepts. Using Bugproof is easy. Upload your firmware and it runs automated analysis and writes a security report for you. The firmware should be unencrypted and be in a supported format and architecture for analysis, but Bugproof will dig into the binaries, identify third-party dependencies, and scan for known vulnerabilities. And they've found several zero-day vulnerabilities in well-known and modern manufacturer devices. Every finding is provided with remediation steps and further details on how the device can be hardened with modern security mechanisms. But the most unique feature of Bugproof is what they call PRIS, an automated engine that finds potential zero-day vulnerabilities and highlights security flaws within code. You've even got an AI assistant to help you out with remediations. All the generated reports can be shared by a link or simply a downloadable PDF. It is too easy using Bugproof for Internet of Things security research. And you can use it for free. Scan firmware for vulnerabilities and hunt for zero days with Bugproof. You can sign up with my link below in the video description, check out the documentation, upload firmware, and get scan results in under a minute. Huge thanks to Bugproof for sponsoring this video. So I don't want you to be too mad at me, but honestly, I think I just want to spend some time in this video showcasing what Bugproof can really put together and rip out for this vulnerable old decade old firmware driver for this router. So let me go ahead and start for free here. Let me continue with Google and I'll use just a throwaway account just so you can like kind of see how this all comes together here. Uh, I do have dark reader on, so maybe the theme is a little bit darker than usual, but if we were to drag and drop files here or upload and provide our vulnerable firmware, we could go ahead and start a new scan where we've got the name for whatever we want. Dark mode is kind of ruining things here. And we'll go ahead and just click on get started. Let's roll. You can see that it is now uploaded and is starting to analyze this firmware. And okay, cool. I clicked on it and it's doing its thing already. Oh, look at this. It's in progress, but it's still like, oh, all right, this was last modified like over nine years ago. Jeez. Kernel version is 2.6.3. <laughs> Architecture's MIPS. Okay, that's to be expected, right? Big Endian here. Ooh, okay, now it's coming through. Look at the maximum severity, absolutely critical. Like the, the gauge and the meter is all the way at the end. Number of vulnerabilities is pretty close to a fluster cuck. <laughs> severity is, okay, medium, still a couple critical though. Does that actually say? By type, oh, dark mode is killing this thing. Everyone shield your eyes. I'm going to turn off dark reader. Okay, all you vampires, the lights are on and now we can finally read the text here. Uh, CWE, oh, they actually have the common weaknesses and exposures listed out for the type and a whole lot of the unsafe function calls. Look at this. These are the things that like they teach you in the like binary exploitation 101 courses of like, don't use stircat, stircopy or system <laughs> printf with whatever sketchy, like no arguments attached to it. For modern mechanisms of security hardening, there's like no, NX bit set, position independent executables, uh, strip binaries. Of course, this thing is a decade old. So like, 
We can't fault them too much here. Let me click into the weak binaries though, because these are the ones that we saw like within the bin folder as we explored this through bin walk from the command line, known vulnerabilities pulling through busy box. Okay, and this is exactly like the first thing that gets booted to, right? Because it is going to be the core of the operating system really, or at least the interface that you get to interact with all the other command line utilities here. So the fact that there are like CVEs that you could just pull off the shelf 2016 for BusyBox, kind of wild. Oh man, especially drilling down on the kernel. Again, the thing's a decade old, but still being able to automatically detect that with just the files kind of neat. Oh, and you can browse the file system? What? That is slick. I'm like genuinely taken back because I didn't know you could do that. Like I didn't even read, I didn't have to record the first half of this video. <laughs> So hey, I hope you thought that was kind of cool. I know we were just kind of dipping our toes in the water, getting our feet wet, starting small, but really I think, you know, that's how you get started. And even if it's a simple foremost or bin walk command, you can still drill down and find some weird stuff. Like, I don't know, base 64 encoded credentials and sometimes like stupid places. But if you want to like, pry open the binaries, of course, throw it in whatever disassemblers you want. Try to find the source code, see what you can do. But if you got an easy button, if you've got some great tooling, that's an awesome thing for your toolkit. If you're in this line of work, if you do a whole lot of Internet of Things security research, please let me know. Look, what else do I need to get learned up and schooled on? And try out bug proof if you haven't before. I think it's wild. I think it's just cool that I can drill down and find all these stuff that could basically be taken advantage of right away. And I don't know if any of you have played like the Internet of Things or the IoT Village, it, like Capture the Flag, their CTF, but a lot of times it's just identifying what devices are out there in the network and then doing the open source like research out on the internet because folks have already beaten this thing up years ago. A lot of the tech is old, but if you wanna be hunting for some new vulnerabilities or those zero days that no one's ever seen before, hey, drilling down into the code and at least getting some quick synopsis analysis is incredible. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do those YouTube algorithm things, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. <laughs> Take care.